Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can spend to get to know you a little bit better. Um, I pray that you would guide our words, uh, guide the discussion in the way that glorifies you. Um, help us, Lord, to grow uh, in, our, in the knowledge of your, of, of your wisdom and all spiritual understanding. Strengthen us, Lord, to do your work and to glorify you in all that we do. Through the intercession of St. Mary, Archangel Michael, and all the saints who have pleased you from the beginning, hear us when we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amin. Welcome back to our catechism. And uh, we're continuing our discussion as we will address uh, God the Father and uh, talk about God as Father. Last session, we, we spoke about the Holy Trinity, and we took uh, a brief understanding, as we can, uh, of who the Holy Trinity is, God as one in three persons, one essence united in love. So <clears throat> before we get into the, the discussion for today, I wanted to kind of highlight a story of the word Father, and what it means. A few years ago, I remember uh, my daughter came up to me and I was working on a sermon. I think it was even during Holy Week. So it's a pretty intense week. And, you know, we tried to give uh, sermons in that week a little bit. We, we put a little more effort in that week because it's the week of weeks. It's the week where Christ showed us the greatest love. And I was, as I was working on the sermon, uh, my daughter came up to me and she says, Daddy, and I stopped everything and I paused. And at that moment, sometimes it doesn't always happen. At that moment, it was joyful to my heart. Uh, sometimes when our kids interrupt us uh, in the middle of something, you know, it's, you know, we get distracted or we may even react in a negative way. But at that moment, it was really joyful. And I turned to her and I said, you know, Abby, what my f favorite word in the whole world is? And then she said, what? And I said, Daddy. And then she looked at me puzzled and she said, You are your favorite word in the whole world? <laughs> and she understood it that I was talking about myself. And I said, No, but when you say it, it's the, my favorite word in the whole world. When you say it. And so um, it really captures just a little, bit of a, a little bit of a snapshot of what God feels when we call him Father. So... <clears throat> In, in discussing tonight, maybe some of us have, you know, had good pictures of a father, and some of us maybe had a negative picture of what a father is, an absent father or even a bad father, I'm sorry to say. Maybe the, uh, some fathers were not present in our life, or maybe some of the fathers even passed at a young age. But whatever the case, God as father surpasses all of that. And even if we had a, a, a tremendous image of what a good father is, still God the Father to us, and the understanding of God as Father, is much greater than that. And so we're going to begin to kind of tackle this today. And we will unpack the, the creed, God willing, throughout the rest of the catechism. We're going to go through the creed. So we speak of, you know, that we believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. And as we go through the creed, we'll understand what the church teaches because it's, it's a beautiful, you know, whole snapshot of what the church gives to us, the understanding of the teaching of the church. And also we'll couple with that the prayer, Our Father, because that's the foundation of all prayers. And every prayer that we have is either an expansion or an abbreviation of the prayer, Our Father, as the Lord taught us. And we'll get into this a little bit later today. But the, the creed came about in two parts. The first two uh, uh, councils, 
the Nicene and the Constantinople Council. And the first council addressed who Christ is, and the second council addressed who the Holy Spirit is. Because there was heresies that denied the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then there was a later heresy that de denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And so these two first councils gave us an understanding that the church had to really address in a formal way. Again, it didn't change the theology of the church because sometimes, as we said before, people try to argue that, oh, now the church has put down a canon or the theology, now the church is formulating what they actually believe. And this is not true. The church always believed in, uh, in the Trinity. The church always believed in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. But to formally and to expand on it and to be able to teach it, this was done through the councils uh, to address again the different heresies that came about. And Mike is going to get into a little bit of the council for us. Um, yeah, so just as Abuna was saying, like, you know, the, the, the church has al always um, understood the Trinity, but, um, you know, as individuals, they might have had trouble maybe articulating something about the Trinity that, that uh, could cause a little bit of problems, or maybe it wasn't quite in line with the, with the traditions that, that we're hand, handing off, and, and it could be um, good people in the church. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the councils also really help to kind of solidify and get everyone on board as to how, how we're supposed to approach these things. Um, so when we're talking now, the, we're trying to learn about the Father. The first part of the creed says that we believe in one God, God the Father, the Pantocrator, or Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. So, <clears throat> in that very brief uh, little t bit of text there, um, we can kind of get an understanding of how the church, from the beginning, saw who the Father is, right? He is seen as the all-powerful being who brought all things into existence from non-existence, right? Um, according to J.N.D. Kelly, the Almighty connotated um, God's all-pervading control and sovereignty over reality, just as Father referred primarily to his role as creator and author of all things, right? So he is like, the, he is the source of all things. He brought everything into being from non-being. He's the cause of all existence. So uh, we can see a little bit of this in, I, I tried to pick some um, Old Testament passages, and even in these Old Testament passages, you see um, the Father and, and how he is uh, creating and, and his greatness and all these things, but you can still see elements of the Trinity within this, right? Um, so the first one I had was in First Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. It says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Thine is the kingdom. O Lord, you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and, are power and might, and in your hand... It is to make great and to give strength to all. Um, and then Isaiah 48, 13, it says, My hand laid the foundations of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. So I, Bruno was saying, like, oh, that sounds like, well, that was Christ. But he's saying my hand did that, right? So the hand might have been Christ, but whose hand? It was the Father's hand, right? So um, you kind of have that going. And then God upholds the universe by his word of power. And again, we see kind of Christ as the word of power, so it's important, especially for uh, early, in the, in the early uh, Judaism times, right, that they had to understand, uh, they, they had to have some understanding of who God the Father was, right? They don't have a good picture yet in the, in the Old Testament, right? Um, because mankind has walked away from God, right? And, and at a very young age, right? Like, from, from the very beginning, they've kind of turned away, right? They've fallen away from God. And so now God is now trying to call them back, right? And he has to, he has to do it in a way, because humanity is young, he, he does it in a way like we, as a father, would um, help a child, right? He has to put certain rules in place. He has to, you know, 
uh, punish if, there's, if, if, if they get out of line, right? Like we see a lot of that in there. Um, but for the Jews, they also needed to understand that God, again, was the creator of all things, right? And we see that in the very beginning, Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, right? Um, and then also, they needed to understand that he was over and above all the powers, right? All of the heavenly host. So the, the early, and, and the, those early peoples, they, they understood uh, that there was gods of many nations, right? And, and they were dealing with a lot of spiritual forces and a lot of spiritual powers, and they had to understand then that God was over and above all of them, right? And they could not hold any God before him. But then moving into the early church, there was other heresies that were kind of coming in. And so then, again, it was very paramount that the church understood that God was, again, the creator of everything and was very personable and was always intimately um, in the mix with people, right? So uh, one, I'm just going to use an example because there was a lot of different heresies that were coming in, right? Uh, but one um, heresy is the Gnostics, Gnosticism. Um, this, this heresy has a lot to do with the nature of Christ, number one, but it also kind of goes back to the, who the Father is, right? So Gnosticism was a little bit of an outcropping of Christianity where they believed that all matter was evil, right? And that Jesus could not have come in the flesh, right? He had to become as a spiritual being. So spiritual things were higher than matter if matter was all evil. And so they believed, I'm not going to get into the whole bit of it because it's very convoluted. I don't even understand all of it, right? But what they believed is that there is this super being, right, that is completely outside of time and space. So that's kind of right, but, but he has nothing to do with anybody, right? Because he's, he's perfect and good and he's absolute, which means that, that, that nothing can touch him or anything like that, right? Um, and so what happens then is in this Gnostic heresy is these emanations. He creates these lesser beings, right? And then out of these lesser beings come more lesser beings. Out of these lesser beings come more lesser beings, right? Until finally there becomes this being called a, like a demiurge that creates the world, right? And so through that creation of the world, um, because he's somewhat evil, uh, all of matter is evil. Right? And one of these aeons, um, well, actually two aeons, actually create Jesus and the Holy Spirit. This is what they believe, right? And so Jesus and the Holy Spirit come and give not only mankind knowledge of who this supreme being are, but even the aeons themselves, because as they worked downward, they, didn't, they lost contact, right? So everything, Gnosticism is about knowledge, right? So in this paradigm, you learn about the aeons and about this supreme being through, through knowledge, right? And you free yourself from the body. That's, you're, you're supposed to, the body is, is supposed to be evil and that we are supposed, we're looking forward to the, to the day when our souls leave the body, right? And you might find that actually a lot in Christianity today. I noticed that there is a lot of Perfect. Gnostic, yeah, ways where we, we, we kind of, we, we put down the body. We put down anything of matter, right? Um, um, in, in the Orthodox Church, we, we lift up matter, right? Because God created it. And as uh, C.S. Lewis I said that matter matters. If God created it, then matter must matter, right? And so we utilize the creation. We utilize our bodies for the worship of God. That is what is truly intended. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, we needed to know that, that God, the early church, it was, it was fundamental that, that, that they knew that God was the creator of heaven and earth and that he was intimately working with his people, right? And then there was uh, another heresy, uh, the Marcion heresy, which kind of believed that the Old Testament God was a separate and distinct God who was cruel, okay? Um, and so, again... The church had to kind of show that God is one, right? There is not two distinct gods working against one another and that kind of thing. So there's a lot in this one little brief couple of sentences to kind of unpack, but it's, it's very fundamental to our, um, 
our belief system, right? And so the, these creeds that are made, they are made very precisely, right? And um, it kind of, you know, we take it for granted now, um, but we take it for granted now, but back then it was, it was very important to keep these things uh, in view, right? So. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here. Uh, kind of just touching on that because as Mike was saying, although these are old heresies that kind of been done away with, uh, some of the thought processes are still kind of happening to today. Sometimes you'll even hear in Christian churches uh, kind of this negative or painted, this uh, negative painted picture of God the Father, that God the Father is really wrathful. God the Father, you know, was this vengeful God and he had to satisfy his wrath. We're not going to get into that too much, but um, there's nothing further from the truth. You know, and this is really what Christ came to show is the love of the Father, right? Sometimes maybe we've had a bad boss or even a relative of ours who's an, or an authority figure, you know, and you, you kind of have to catch them on a good day to speak to them. You know, I, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about when, when we have certain types of people in our lives where, you know, oh, they're not in a good mood today. You know, we should probably, you know, give them some space. But God is very different from that, right? God is not emotional like the way we're emotional. He doesn't have these passing emotions and experiences. We don't have to catch God on a good day. God is always waiting for us, and He's always Father. And not just Father, He even takes it a step further, right? The Scripture tells us in Romans, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And that word Abba is such a beautiful word because the closest word to Abba in English would be like Papa, right? or in Arabic, Baba, you know? It's a, a term of endearment. It's a very, very beautiful, intimate, you know, uh, name that God desires that we call Him, right? Abba, Father. And even the Lord Jesus Christ even prayed that, Abba, Father. Also in Galatians, He said, uh, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit inside of us is to teach us how to pray and to call God not just Father but Abba a beautiful way to address Him so you know sometimes it sounds even funny that God really wants us to call Him Papa but this is how God wants us to know Him right uh, recently <laughs> my daughter started switching from Daddy to Dad and that was like kind of like a heartache for me no it's like they're they're growing up they're no, no longer calling me Daddy but uh, you know, again, we get a little sense of what God desires of how we see Him. That He is the Father that is well acquainted with everything we're going through. All our needs, all our desires, all our hurts, all our struggles. Everything, every ailment, every pain, every, everything we, we face. Everyone that treats us in a, in a way that hurts us. Our beautiful Father, our Papa is well acquainted and watches us and knows very well what we are going through. It says in Jeremiah 23, 23, I am God at hand. I am God at hand. God who is nearby. Okay? So, <clears throat> as we go through the, the structure of the creed, um, we're going to take, again, we're going through the Father today. Next week we're going to go and address who the Son is, our Lord Jesus Christ. But, Again, it's, uh, it's important for us to understand the unity of the Trinity. Even though we're addressing the three persons of the Trinity, there is that unity that we spoke about, all united in love. Um, as we continue our catechism, I want us to also be reminded that it's not just good to learn and to kind of you know, take in what we're learning together, but to actually live this out. Because it means nothing if this is all just knowledge that we place in our, in our mind and we kind of just ponder every once in a while. If we're not learning and if we're not living and being devoted and if we're not living a life of repentance, it actually it will do nothing for us, right? And actually, knowledge, the, the scriptures say, if we just take in knowledge, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So we have to understand this and live this in love with God. Um, so God the Father, the Pantocrator, 
God wants us to know Him first and foremost. Even when the Lord uh, told us and taught us how to pray. If we remember, uh, the, the prayer, Our Father, is mentioned in two of the Gospels. In the Gospel of St. Matthew and the Gospel of St. Luke. And St. Luke gives us uh, a little bit of a background of what the Lord was doing right before the Sermon on the Mount. It says that He was... He spent all night in prayer in the mountain and then he came down and then he gave the sermon on the mount. And in that sermon, uh, which is the most famous sermon, he gave us the most famous prayer, which is the Our Father prayer, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is exactly in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord gave us this term of how we address God as Father. He said it 17 times. Your Father in Heaven. Or call out Father. Right When you say pray our Father. 17 times he mentions to hammer home. To drive into us. This is how God wants us to know Him. God is the loving Father. right? And again addressing that issue that we might see in other traditions that God is this vengeful God. This is, again, not, there's no further from the truth. God is the loving Father who has adopted us. And there's a distinction, there's a distinction between our sonship and the sonship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is important to mention. So Christ came so that we become sons and daughters of, of, of God, but we are children of God in a different sense, right? So God's fatherhood to Christ is different than the fatherhood to us. Christ is son by nature. We are children by adoption. Okay? Now what does that mean? What does that mean that we are children by adoption and Christ is son by nature? So God was always father and Christ was always son. Christ didn't become the son of God. He was always the son of God. Okay? Begotten of the father as we say in the creed what? Before all ages. Before all ages, right? So that means there was never a time where the Lord Jesus Christ w did not exist, okay? But He came so that we become children of God, so that we become born again. And this is what the word born again, you might hear the term born again Christian quite often. The actual term born again Christian means those who are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and received the Holy Spirit in the Mayroon or the laying on of hands, okay? This is what it means to be born again. And that term came when the Lord was discussing with Nicodemus. If you remember, right? He said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand it. He thought it was a physical sense. Does that mean I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born? And he said, no. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he said it twice. Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And unless one is born of water and Spirit. To be born again means to be baptized, okay? Uh, in the way that we understand baptism, the sacrament of baptism, it's not just, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, but baptism is not just a symbolic washing. Baptism, there is something truly changing our nature so that we become children of God. And we call the, the baptismal font the womb of the church, the womb of the church to make us children of God. So we are children by grace. Again, Christ is, is son by nature. And even the Lord Jesus Christ made this distinction and people understood it when he spoke about this distinction. There was times when the Lord would speak to the Pharisees and he called God Father. And the Pharisees, what did they do? They picked up stones, they wanted to stone him. Because they understood what Christ meant when he said, God is my father. He said, you, he said, why are you seeking to kill me? Because he knew what was in their hearts, but this is to reveal to us. We're seeking to kill you not because, out of the works, uh, not because of the, the works, works you're doing, but you called God your father, making yourself equal to God. Okay? When he, but they, they said of themselves that we are children of God. We have, we are children of God. So, they understood that there was a distinction again. Christ is son by nature. But does that mean that God loves us any less? Absolutely not. 
He loves us just as He loves the Son. The Lord prayed this in John 17, again, one of the most important chapters of the Bible. John 17, 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The love with which you loved me may be in them. That greatness, the fulfillment, the infinite love that the Father has for the Son may be in us. Okay? And also, we all know the John 3.16, For God so loved the world, right, that He gave His only begotten Son. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? He didn't spare His own Son of His love. Okay? Also in John 15, verse 9, As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. So God's love for us, even though we are adopted children, doesn't mean it's diminished in any way. It's such a great love. Um, well, yeah, it is a great love. I, I wanted to kind of just go in back on the... Um, Kind of the Old Testament aspect of the God, just just for a moment, because a lot of people seem to tend to, to think that God in the Old Testament was um, not loving, right? Um, but that's I, when, when I read the Old Testament, I, I definitely get a, a different view. I see God again, a God who is working with a young humanity that is turned away and is doing a lot of uh, bad things that He's trying to bring them back into um, a way of right ordering, right? And so um, just, a, just a couple of verses that I had from Old Testaments about God's love was, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your fathers, he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Right? So he loved him, he kept an oath, he, 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 he kept with it. And he says... Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourselves with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Right? So God saw that these people... The, the Israelites were, were in a lot of distress, and he's saying, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to bring you back to joy, right? Um, lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Um, God loves us with an abundant love, right? And uh, Abuna has already kind of talked a little bit about it, but, you know, my background was from the, from the Protestant tradition, and I did carry some baggage coming into the Orthodox um, tradition, which was my, my tradition taught me that the Father was offended by us, right? Was angered by our sins and was completely offended and turned his back from us, right? And that <clears throat> that was the wall that, that, that kind of separated us from God, right? Like we, we he, it was because he kind of turned away from us. And it, it was kind of a hard thing because Jesus, obviously, was the one who saves us, right? And in that tradition, that's, that's what I believe is like Jesus comes, he takes on the wrath of the Father because any sin that we sin against God is an infinite God, right? It becomes an infinite sin within God, right? So it takes now Christ, who is also God, right, to take on the wrath and, and, and do away with that infinite sin, right? So Christ kind of takes the bullet, right? God um, pours out the wrath onto the Son. The Father pours out his wrath onto the Son. And that really breaks the Trinity right there, right? Because now you have a God who is one, who is perfect in love, now has just been set against the other, right? And that destroys all the theology of the Trinity, just right, th right then and there. 
But that's what I was taught to believe. It made sense in that paradigm, like, yes, I've sinned. And so if I, the, the kind of the example was like, if I step on a cockroach, well, you know, it's, a, it's an inferior being, so it's not really that bad. Like if I, if I kill an animal, well, now that we're getting into something bigger, if I kill a human, now I, there's bigger consequences. I would probably be put to death or maybe prison for the rest of my life. But if I sin against an infinite God, well, now what am I going to do, right? So <clears throat> the baggage that I carried coming in was that Jesus was my friend and loved me, but the Father was always kind of angry and, and thank God for, for Jesus because if it wasn't for him, God would be wrathful toward me, right? Um, and then what does that do then if the object of your worship takes on certain characteristics, right? Like you worship something, and it, and it has these, spe these particular characteristics, what happens to you? The object of your worship, you become like the thing you worship, right? So you can become kind of an angry person, right? You can become kind of a judgmental person. You can start to see the people around you you know, dealing their, the, the sins, right? And then you start to be, judge them and you start to, to, to feel wrath toward them, right? Because your father does the same thing, right? And of course, now I've been saved, like I've gotten the shield, right? Uh, but everyone else hasn't. And of course, I want them to get that same shield. But when I experience, when I see them in their sin, I, there's a little bit of contempt. There's a little bit of uh, judgment, obviously, right? So uh, we have to, it's, that's why it's so very, very important that the, the church, as it was forming its doctrines, it needed, to, it needed to show a very true picture of who God is because who we worship uh, becomes who we are, right? And, th and that is orthodox theology, right? We are trying to become like God, right? We are trying to, God has, has shown himself through Christ to be humble, meek, right? Very famous saying by St. Athanasius. God became man so that we can become him, like him. Yeah. Right? And actually, piggybacking on, on Mike's point here is that this is not very, this is not scriptural. What we see, actually, the most beautiful image of the father, there's two stories that really highlight the love of a father, mm -hmm. right? Which is Abraham and the story of the prodigal son. In both of the stories... What is the overarching theme? It's the love of, of the father, right? So we, we all know the story of Abraham with, with the slaughter of Isaac. You know, this was the son of the promise. This is the son that he's been praying for for years and years and years, was given to him in his old age. And in his seed, it says that, you know, all nations would be blessed. And God tested Abraham, right? He called for him and he said to him to sacrifice his son Isaac. But... Abraham was willing to because of his love for God. Although it says in Hebrews that he had faith that God would bring him back up, even if he slayed him, that God would bring him back up because he knew the promise. But again, this is the image that we see is that this father who loves this son, this is his son that he's been praying for and, 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 and dying to have all of his life. And he, God gave, it, gave him this son. And he is willing to sacrifice him because of his love for God. So again, a little of the image of God's love for us. What he went through to, in order to save us. And the other image is the story of the prodigal son. right? The father and the prodigal son. The father who bears with the son's weaknesses. Saying to his father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. Goes and squanders everything. Lives in, in complete sin. <clears throat> and what is this father doing the whole time? Waiting for the son, searching the son, for the son. His eyes going to and fro, searching for when his son would come back. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the servants that saw him, how, how he was so pained, right? And this is the image that God gives to us for every, son, every person that's living away from God. How God sees us, waiting for us to come back to his bosom, to his arms. And what does he do? He kills the fatted calf. He comes and he embrace, embraces him. He puts on the robe on him. Gives him, you know, washes all his, his wounds and, and all the filth. And gives him the signet ring, right? And makes the biggest party ever. And I love to say is that, you know, 
Whenever we hear of parents throwing a, a party for their children, it's usually like, you know, they graduated from, you know, some great institution or, you know, they, they, they got married, right? But this is, you know, what, what, what party was this? Is celebrating the son who completely disrespected and, you know, took his father for granted and came back uh, in, in, in complete humility. And the, the father gave him the greatest ever feast uh, to show his love. <coughs> so this is the, the love of God the Father that we understand that the, the church has always given to us. This is the love that is offered to each, each person that Christ that comes to know Christ as we said I want to I want to actually uh, mention a little uh, beautiful saying here by Saint Cyprian of calling God Father especially after those who are baptized this is what he says <clears throat> we are new men we have been reborn and restored to God by his grace we have already begun to be his sons and we can say father John reminds us of this. He came to his own home and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believe in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Profess your belief that you are sons of God by giving thanks. Call upon God who is your Father in heaven. How merciful the Lord is to us. How kind and richly compassionate. He wished us to repeat this prayer in God's sight, the prayer of our Father. To call the Lord our Father, and as Christ is God's Son, to be, be called in turn sons of God. None of us would ever have dared to utter this name unless he himself had allowed us to pray in this way. And therefore, dear friends, we should bear in mind and realize when we call God our Father, we also ought, ought to act like sons. If we are pleased to call him Father, let him in turn be pleased to call us sons. And this kind of brings us to our next point, is that... It's not that just God wants us to know Him as Father. He invites us to, to see Him as this beautiful Father and this loving image. But he, for us to be calling Him Father, we have to be the true children that He calls us to be, right? To live according to His standards. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ said. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who loves me keeps my words. He who does not love me does not keep my commandments. Over and over and over again to reiterate you know, what it means to be a child of God. I don't have too much to add, I don't think. I, 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 I guess I was just thinking, uh, you know, that for those of us that are, um, have children of, of, of our own, I think that is always, I've always saw that as a great picture as to how the Father can relate to us, right? No matter how old we are, we're still as little babies to Him, right? Little infants, little toddlers, running around, not knowing what we're doing, you know, making all kinds of mistakes, right? Um, but just as with your own children, when, you're little, when your little one is running around and doing all these, making these little mistakes, you never love them less, right? You're, you're, you're correcting them, you're laughing with them, you're, you're cuddling them, right? Like, I mean, this is, I, I really feel like this is the picture of God the Father that I kind of didn't have when I was in my other tradition, but now I've, I've kind of come and I see that, like, Father is truly loving, and I and I, it, it's interesting because I never really noticed how much Christ really tried to show us how much the Father loves us. Uh, there's an, when he talks about like you know you as as a as a parent knows how to give good gifts to your children, right? So do you think your Father in heaven, if you ask him something, he's going to give you you know something bad, right? Like if if you as a parent if they ask for an egg, you're not going to give them, you know, a stone. snake or a stone, right? Yeah, like, <clears throat> God is, wants to give you the good things. God wants to give you everything. He wants to give you the kingdom, right? Um, he wants you with him for eternity. And I think that that's, that's the picture of God that I have been um, striving to, to know and understand as it, as it relates to the Father. Right? So the Father is not distant. He is with us. Mm -hmm. And He is always there with us. So. Yeah. I want to finish off with this last um, point that I wanted to make. So sometimes we experience what we call God's anger, right? Yeah. And oh. what is that? What is God's anger? It's not 
It's not an anger like we experience anger. You know, somebody does something to us to get up, get us upset, and we want to, you know, take kind of be, be vengeful and you know, um, you know, kind of show the person our wrath. But God's anger is actually refusing to accept His love, refusing to accept His love, and we just face the consequences of that, right? It's not that God is angry and He's, you know, actively punishing us. Is that you are shielding yourself from His grace? You're shielding yourself from His hands, you know, protecting you, and you're taking matters into your own hands, or you decide to leave His side, and then that's when we open ourselves to more attacks and and not not feeling the blessing that He has called us all to to enjoy, right? Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to finish off with that because, you know, sometimes we'll use these terms. You know of God that that we experience or that we we know very yeah. we're very well acquainted of in, in our emotional state of being, but God is very different than that, right? Yeah, yeah the so. scriptures use a lot of language for to help us understand something about about God, right? Like, but if it says like God is is you know the God's wrath is going to abide on us or something like that, right? That's really coming from our perspective. Right? It's just, again, just as your child, when if, they, if, if, if they're stumbling into something bad and you have to get at them, right? And you have to kind of, to them it sounds like, oh, you know, you're mad at me or that kind of thing, right? And you might not be mad. You might be just trying to get their attention, right? Um, it's that same kind of thing. God doesn't have these passions or these emotions that drive him, right? There's no need within God. There's, no, there's nothing that we can do um, to have power over God. We can't make him angry. We can't make him sad or you know, these types of things, right? Like he, he, doesn't, he doesn't experience reality in, in that way as we do. But the scriptures are trying to, God through the inspiration of the spirit is trying to speak to us in ways that we can understand just as when we speak to a child, we speak in very simplistic terms. We don't explain all of the nuances of every aspect of what we're trying to say we just try to get the point across right and that's what a lot of times what the scripture is doing because again we're babies we're the we're the toddlers running around right and we need we need the guidance and so the scriptures are giving us this very simp simplistic way of helping us to understand god mm -hmm. so. i'll finish off with one last verse uh this is the lord jesus christ gave this, this to us in john 16 26 through 28 in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you. So Christ, although he is the mediator between us and the Father, it doesn't mean that he's always, you know, kind of the middle, middle person between us and getting to God. Because he says, in that day, I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Right? So he came to give us access to back to God uh, so just you know as we uh, approach now speaking of, of the Lord Jesus Christ it's a good segue into understanding the person of Christ and the redemption uh, and salvation that we attain through what the Lord Jesus uh, came to do so uh, may the Lord give us the grace to continue our path to learn and to understand him more and more each and every day glory be to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit now and forever the age world begin We'll stand up to pray and then we'll do question and answer after. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, that we are called your children and that we can live, Lord, knowing always that we can come to you no matter what we've done. Let us recognize, Lord, when we sin against you, how we turn our backs from you and that we leave your side. Let us never, ever take your love for granted, but come to you always, Lord, as the prodigal son, seeking, Lord, to just to be in your, ho in your home and to be a servant in your house. Thank you, Lord, for honoring us and giving us a chance always to come back and return to you no matter what we've done. Bless us always, Lord, and fill our hearts with joy and peace. Surround us with your angels, Lord, and keep our eyes always focused on you. Through the intercession of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, 
Archangel Michael and all the saints and the angels who please you since the beginning. Hear us, O Lord, as we say thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, O God, amen. Love of God the Father, grace and begotten Son, Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. We get the communion of the Holy Spirit with you. All go in peace, peace, Lord be with you. If you guys want to stay seated,